Hi everybody, good morning and uh, welcome to the first ever Webflow Flow State webinar. Thanks uh, attendees for joining promptly. We really appreciate that. Uh, great to see so many people on the call today as well. Um, really happy for everyone to join from all time zones. And yeah, this is our first webinar, so hopefully it goes well. Thank you for the team. Uh, without our team, this wouldn't be possible. So thanks everyone for putting in the hard work uh, for us to be here today. So by way of a quick agenda, we're gonna cover a few topics today. I'm gonna speak for a few minutes on how we think about infrastructure and data and the digital transformation that's happening all around us. And then we're gonna hear from some of our customers. So we got some great stories from our customers uh, that we wanna share. And then Richard, our PM is going to um, give you a glimpse of the merchant data platform. We're really excited to show you know, what the next iteration of Woeflow looks like and how it operates. And then we're very excited that we have a guest speaker with us today, Ross Epstein from SafeGraph and Jordan, our, my co-founder, he's going to have a great discussion with him a bit later. And then we'll finally get to uh, some questions and answers uh, from our attendees. So welcome again, everybody. Uh, I'm Will Bewley. I'm one of the co-founders of Woeflow. And really what I want to talk about today is Woeflow's journey. So how do we go from a Facebook post to quickly becoming the data infrastructure that powers a lot of today's online ordering? I'm going to discuss some trends that we've been seeing in supporting this digital shift and the transformation happening to industries all around us, as well as talk about where the digital shift is heading. So I founded Woeflow in 2017 with my co-founder Jordan and We've come a long way since then. We certainly didn't think we'll be hosting a webinar today. I wanted to share the actual story behind how Woeflow started, and that was a single Facebook post. And yes, Jordan's name on Facebook is Rumpelstiltskin. So this was the post uh, back in 2017, and two people reached out to Jordan from this. Um, he was playing around with a project in the evenings uh, whilst working at a company and wanted some feedback. And so um, I reached out to him and I, he was one of my friends when I moved to San Francisco five or six years ago. I said, yeah, I'd love to, to, to chat about this side project. And uh, a second person reached out as well, our friend Talene, who uh, then actually became the cus uh, first customer. So uh, with this one post, Jordan found himself a co-founder in me and we found our first customer, which was pretty awesome. So I want to share my take on a few key themes that really underpin everything that we do here at Woeflow and also how we think about the world around us. So contrary to popular Silicon Valley gospel um, coined by Mark Andreessen that software is eating the world, here at Woeflow we fundamentally believe that data is eating the world. And so Woeflow was founded on this premise. Our mission from the beginning is to structure the world's unstructured data. A lot of companies are building and digitizing uh, a lot of different industries. And really the key to a lot of those businesses underpinning that is structuring that data. And how do you digitize these traditional industries? So for the whole time, companies have been building in areas like banking and finance, um, e-commerce, um, now, even more so, same-day delivery, food ordering, lots of different interesting areas. What quickly becomes a bottleneck for a lot of those businesses is access to this high-quality structured data. And, and that really, as I say, can become a bottleneck. So Jordan and I found a workflow on the belief that structured data and getting access to structured data will help unlock trillions of dollars of value for businesses over the next decade. And so we've been hearing about digital transformation for a while now. Uh, for some people, it might seem over. Um, the, the early 2000s bygone era of, uh, and the rise of e-commerce. But really, we see it as the digital shift starts at the innovator's edge 
and eventually seeps into all industries in all corners of the world. So it starts with digital experiences, the pioneers here in the early 2000s being you know, companies like PayPal and eBay. But today, even more traditional industries are going through their moment, you know, like malls and big box retailers did in the 2000s, with the rise of e-commerce. And so a lot of these traditional industries are rapidly finding their homes online as well, whether that's grocery, convenience stores, even parts of high tech manufacturing are being drop shipped through apps. And so what is driving this? We think a lot of it is the move to convenience that a lot of us have been seeing. And so generally speaking, when we do have as consumers more convenience, we generally don't go back to, to old ways. The second part of that, and really speeding up this digital transformation that we have been seeing and, and will continue to see, ultimately has been also the global pandemic. And so unfortunately, we've had to live through this for the last year. Uh, it has created a bunch of innovation in the space and digital transformation, as I say, has been sped up by five or six years, I think some experts say, uh, because of being bound to our homes. So we've been working this last few years with a number of small and large businesses and talking to them, it's become apparent for companies, particularly platforms and marketplaces, that they have a hard time even just creating, maintaining, and utilizing the structured data. So our initial product that we launched three years ago helped customers with tooling to assist in unlocking value from their unstructured data. And as we grew, we got more feedback, we started looking at first principles. And we thought, could we offer an even better experience for our customers and their end customers if we also were to offer full end-to-end -end data automation? And so something that we've been working on for the past year or so is really how can we look at it from the ground up again and at those first principles. This has led us excitedly to the launch of our task automation engine and the, the rise of the world's first merchant data platform, which we're really excited about showing you in a little bit uh, with Richard later today. We're proud that Wayflow has had an impact on our customers. At this point, we can uh, announce that we've helped our customers with onboarding over half a million merchants to their platforms. And we're really proud about that stat. So we've helped our customers create millions of digital experiences for their customers. And we'll be hearing some of their stories right after this. So where do we think digital transformation is headed? My girlfriend recently asked me off the cuff, really, is there anything you wouldn't buy online? And I was stumped. I had been thinking about this question for a few weeks. And every time I thought I was getting close to an answer, I would think about it a little bit more and I'd fail with that example. And yes, that may be my biased view. I live here in San Francisco, uh, the tech capital, but the world's digitizing all over as well. So it was only a few years ago that we'd have hesitancy buying things like clothes online. What if I got the wrong size? What if returns are difficult? What if I had to pay for returns? That's not really crossed my mind um, very recently with the likes of ASOS, on-demand delivery. Um, it's extremely easy to make returns and things like that. Now, people browse and purchase houses online. People buy and lease and even sell their car online. Our friends over at Favor Delivery do same-day jewelry delivery all over Texas for their retailer. And further afield in Latin America, it's actually more common to request cash through an app and have it delivered to your home than it is to go to the ATM. And as some of you might know, practically everything is wrapped up as a digital experience in a super app in China. And so a lot of successful companies today, they've had to ultimately build and maintain their data infrastructure and data stack as when they started, it didn't exist. 
And we're really proud to support those businesses. But we're also really excited about the possibilities that are being unlocked today. So with the increasing number of data companies and data infrastructure companies like Woflow and our friends over at Safegraph, the rails are being built. And the next data revolution is around the corner that's going to be powering the next iteration of the digital transformation. And we're very excited to see what's going to be built on top of it. So we started Woflow to solve a customer headache of really accessing structured data. We wanted to unlock trillions of dollars in value that exists in industries that are digitizing and going through those pain points and ultimately unlocking the opportunity for those businesses and consumers that come with that. Companies rely on us to provide now the seamless automated experience in their data management. And we built an awesome team around us to help with this digital transformation that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So before we get to show you the new platform, I wanted to introduce some customers who we had recently the opportunity of talking to and learning a bit more about their data challenges as well as their experiences in working with Woflow. Uh, thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Well, at the time the pandemic hit, SnackPass's main customer base was university students, and most of the businesses that we partnered with were around universities, and it was a, a little bit dependent on students being on campus and being able to frequent those businesses. So when the pandemic hit and universities sent everybody home, that was obviously a very huge challenge. So the pandemic created an influx of new merchant partnerships with Waver as restaurants were trying to like adapt to a contact contactless world. And this led to a sudden and massive increase in case volume and manage menu management for the content team. And it required us to ra rapidly adapt. The pandemic drove up our, uh, our volume, our, our customer volume. It also drove a lot of customers who were um, using the service for the first time. Uh, as conditions change, and so all across uh, all across the state, and so uh, that meant that sort of accurate content became even more important. Because of the pandemic, most restaurants were forced to shut down, and they would no longer be able to do dine-in, and so they all had to solely rely on online ordering for their revenue. And so we were able to scale very, very quickly because of this. And most restaurants were in uh, des were desperate to find a platform that would able that would be able to cut down costs for them, but also provide them a platform to um, power online ordering. The main way it shifted was just the time investment. So something that just takes a couple of minutes to complete is a very achievable daily action. If you're having to do it 100 times, but then if you have to do it a thousand times or 5,000 times or more. So obviously once we started scaling up, the decision we made was to look for technologies that could help alleviate that, that volume issue from SnackPass. Before we partnered with Woflow, I had a menus team that was growing. And so I was in charge of finding those people, interviewing them, training them, and then monitoring their day-to-day -day work and also monitoring a lot of great, but very big personalities. Um, and it just became more and more time consuming the larger the team got. So before our partnership with Wolflow, all aspects of like new merchant setup and management was handled by our team manually 100%. With the very little manpower that we did have, um, you know, it was very difficult to onboard 10 plus locations per week. Now we're able to, you know, we're at the point where we are signing up 50 plus locations per week. And we're also able to onboard and get them through the pipeline activated at the same rate as well. The complexity of our menus uh, actually changed pretty significantly uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, which is good, right? It means it, it, that our service uh, will improve. Um, but, you know, it, it would have been, um, certainly not with the size of team that we have it wouldn't have it's not something that would have been sustainable to sort of uh without the support of Wolflow to have the team sort of build out 
and sort of maintain all those menus given the, the additional complexity. Being able to rely on Workflow for um, handling larger menu build-outs has allowed us to maintain um, the efficient levels of many production our team has ever produced before. And that has also freed up time on our plate to focus more on other aspects of the merchant and customer experience. As we were starting to look and sort of why Woflow as opposed to some of the, the competition, I think there are definitely a lot of other people out there who are sort of offering, you know, the ability to sort of provide this data as a service. I think most of them, um, a lot of them say they have a tool as well. I think as we started to dig into it, a lot of it wasn't actually a tool. It was existing technologies that they would then essentially build out to sort of exactly what you needed, um, but not necessarily sort of, you know, something that they're focused on all the time. So, you know, we were looking for somebody that was going to sort of, um, one, that it was their focus. They weren't doing, you know, a hundred other things and, and this was just a service they offered. Um, but also, you know, one where we could sort of rely on the insight you had um, and the things you were doing and sort of to open up possibilities for us for things that we could potentially support in the future. Um, for us, the choice to go with Woflow was pretty obvious. I mean, building and managing an in-house team is obviously a, a huge endeavor. Right now, I manage both customer support and menus. Um, and the reason that I'm able to manage both departments is because of Woflow. And even then, you know, menu revisions, if we need to quickly you know, update prices, um, having Woflow be able to help us with that is super valuable and has really definitely helped us increase the amount of activated locations that we can achieve per week. The best thing that I like about Woflow is that whenever we have any feedback, um, you know, the team is super receptive of that feedback and they'll make sure to like, you know, whatever many updates that need to be done in a timely manner, anything that needs to be prioritized, anything that's an urgent request, like they're always on it. And another main benefit is that, you know, prior to Woflow, we sort of had our own definition of what industry standards were for naming conventions of, you know, modifier groups. And it wasn't until we started working with Woflow that we now are following the industry standard, you know, for menu creation, naming conventions, um, optimization. And that has also helped us a ton. Um, not only that, but we're able to make, it's more clear for the customer and the restaurant what the modifier group names should be and the naming conventions for those. And that has been a huge contributing factor to just being successful and being able to optimize the menus in a way that makes sense across all platforms and keeping them all uniform. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's been enjoying the webinar so far. A thank you to our customers for sharing their experiences. My name is Richard uh, and I'm the PM at Woflow. I'd like to spend around like five minutes sharing with you our flagship product, the Merchant Data Platform. Cue trumpets and drum roll. With this platform, you're able to essentially request, manage, and interact with the job. So what's a job? Simply put, a job is anything that needs to be completed by us, like digitalize this new holiday menu or update the hot dog section. And it's all done here without dealing with endless spreadsheets or God forbid, sending emails. Uh, and there's a lot of features, but I will, I will make it short. So let's give you a quick tour of the room. Um, you're able to manage your catalogs. Here in a catalog can be something like a restaurant's menu. You're able to manage your merchants, both multi-unit merchants, as well as mom and pa's. So let's just say for Mike's Burgers here, you're able to see version control for both the jobs that were requested specifically for this Mike's Burgers or all the catalogs associated. But the crux and the cool stuff all is with managing and requesting jobs. So regarding managing your jobs, this is the page you're going to see uh, the jobs that are currently in progress. That is jobs that are on our plate, um, as well as jobs that are complete, jobs that have already been done. So I want to quickly demo how to request a job. So let's just say, for example, we're using the uh, building a new, new catalog. And the example I'll use um, is quickly anecdotal. I went to school in Chicago. There's this classic restaurant, if, if you know, you know, um, that everyone's always hyped about. It's called the Med. And because of the pandemic, they had to adapt and digitalize before they're very much like walk-in only. 
Uh, and since then, they've been doing well. So I think it's an apt example. So requesting a new catalog, 57th Medici, there we go. And it pipes in all this information. Uh, let's just say this, the Met is really excited about us. So Rush, which is a 24 hour SLA, I drop in their URL and then I'm submitting, I am good to go. So no emails, no spreadsheets, it's really just 10 seconds. Of course, we can also set up a um, automated sync with an existing workflow, uh, say with Salesforce integration. So that job request actually doesn't take 10 seconds, but it actually takes zero, it's fully automated. So what happens when that job is now in progress? Well, um, as the client, you, you kind of just chill. You can hang back. Uh, you can think of this as a little bit of a ticketing solution, similar to Jira or Salesforce. Uh, say the Met was like, actually, we have a secret menu. We totally forgot to tell you. No problem. You can update job sources. Uh, if something's wrong, you can flag it to us. You also don't need to take this and then send us an email about it. You can just do two-way communication with our team directly through this job ticket here by leading a comment. It means keeping track and managing jobs becomes seamless. So again, your job is over at this point, but I did wanna pop the hood and show you a little bit what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, again, this is not client facing, you don't see this, but there's some tech magic and we kinda of wanna show off. So uh, let me go through that right now. This is what we call the task automation engine. And there's two parts to call out. The first is in a traditional setting, you might get hey, build the meds menu uh, as one task to one person. And we do two things fundamentally different. Rather than one task, we have dozens and dozens of micro tasks that can be done asynchronously. So these are tasks that have been trained on specific ML models, a huge data set of catalog and other data. And then rather than have one person go and verify all that, we have a distributed workforce of thousands of trained micro taskers. So these are folks who verify and QA every single step of the way. And these tasks start from things like identifying what the appetizer or dessert sections are, all the way to going ahead and tagging items as vegan or gluten-free. So that we both have industry high accuracy rates, subtle flex, uh, and because we're achieving our goal slowly but surely of achieving full automation, we're able to do it accurately and fast. So that's a little tour of what you're seeing here behind the scenes popping back the hood. And so now this job is essentially done. You can go ahead and, I mean, be, be good to go. If something looks a little wrong, you can go ahead and flag it. But we also know that some teams do some post-processing QA. So no problem, we built a feature specifically for that. This is a feature that facilitates um, going ahead and making any change you like onto the catalog, whether it's something minor uh, or you know, changing an entire section. So looking at, for example, let's say breakfast, you can go ahead and see the sections, the items, all the way down to the modifiers, things that you can go change and publish. Of course, if you're already integrated with the system, um, it's seamless, you're already all set. So essentially, you know, that is the merchant data platform in a nutshell. Uh, now, speedy demo over, I'd like to hand it over to Jordan, who's going to go um, have a really exciting conversation with SafeGraph around democratizing access to data. Thank you, Richard, and hello, everybody. I am Jordan, the other half of the founding team here at Woflow. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Ross Epstein, VP of New Projects at SafeGraph. For those of you who are unfamiliar with SafeGraph, they are the source of truth for data on physical places, providing points of interest, building footprint, and foot traffic data for over 7 million locations in the US, UK, and Canada. Organizations across industries leverage SafeGraph data into their market analytics, investment research, site selection, and more. SafeGraph is a founding member of PlaceKey, the standard unique identifier for places. A little bit about Ross. He's led SafeGraph's involvement in the PlaceKey initiative, expanding adoption of the unique identifier amongst industry leaders and growing a user community of over 7,000 data scientists. Prior to SafeGraph, he was the CEO and co-founder of sales engagement platform Sendbloom, later acquired by LinkedIn. But most importantly, he competes in competitive eating contests, 
most notably the 2010 Tater Tot champion of Evanston. Oh Ross, gosh. welcome to the digital stage. I told you I'd throw that one in there. Yeah, for thanks you. for that one, Jordan. Good to see you. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, let's just dive right in. Yeah. Excellent. So your stated mission is to democratize access to data for everyone. Wolfflows is to structure the world's unstructured data. Data businesses have been all over the news these days, including yours with your recent raise. Congrats on that, by the way. And the question, why is structured data so important, yet so unsexy? Yeah, so, so it's kind of like a two-part question. The first part being, let's talk on the democratization portion, right? The democratization portion of, of making data available to anybody in a, in a very cheap and economical and fast to acquire fashion is has historically been like super challenging, right? Like there's been a handful of groups and organizations and companies, large technology organizations who have the means and the resources and acquire the majority and the vast amount of data that's not necessarily accessible to, to all the other innovators, the, sort of the long tail of technology companies and innovators who might wanna build and build incredible tools and, and workflows on top of that. Um, so starting with democratization is, is a great thing. You, you just want to make data available, but to go to the, the structured portion of it, right? Like if everything, let's imagine that all data was available and fully democratized. If it, if it was fully unstructured, it's, it's quite challenging to have to actually wrangle, right? And so the idea of, of if, essentially the old phrase with data, garbage in, garbage out, right? And if you don't necessarily have anything structured with it, and it's just a bunch of raw data, you're spending almost more of your time trying to structure that. Uh, and so that's why something so exciting as Woflow has been has been exceptionally cool. And, and being able to watch people actually use structured data has been a good thing. Awesome. Yeah, we can definitely acknowledge the uh, importance of structuring garbage. Um, excellent. So. Uh, how do you think the pandemic impacted the importance for businesses having a data strategy? And how does SafeGraph see that impact on the digital transformation many industries are going through? Yeah, so I think like, it, it, it's funny, I, I think this was mentioned earlier on in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the comment where, or earlier on in the webinar where, where somebody was like, uh, if, um, like th there's never a possibility of groups like realizing a better way to do something and then deciding that they should stop doing it like when that immediate need has gone away right so for example with covid right people people immediately understand that they needed high quality data to be able to make decisions and make decisions quickly right they needed to know how retailers were impacted they needed to know how the economy was being impacted and then this sort of was a catalyst to allow groups to start jumping into data a lot faster, right? For us, for at least on the SafeGraph side, we didn't necessarily see sort of we saw we saw businesses that we thought were maybe three years out from having a data strategy realize that they needed one sooner because uh, and and because they needed to make decisions faster on high on high. Uh, essentially on high precision data, and so being able to provide those things allowed. I don't know, allowed groups to make these decisions. And so the concept that you might like at the end of the day, you're like, huh, well, I've got this really fast moving data and it's really high quality. Maybe I should stop using it at a certain point was kind of like, we heard that come up a few times that, oh yeah, we're only going to need it, need it during COVID. And that has, and of course, like that's not necessarily been true. Like people realize that this is hugely valuable. And so it's just kind of brought in that data strategy a little bit sooner than what we thought the time horizon might have been originally. Is there anything specific that you guys did to help your customers in this very specific time during COVID? Like if they are in need of a larger data set um, and they're claiming it's temporarily, but it's like a very large influx, like, is there something that you've done to kind of, um, I guess, uh, accommodate that? Yeah. So uh, I guess it's been Almost a year to the day. Wow. Uh, almost a year to the day, we decided to save graph being a, being a company who sells effectively location data and, and data about the physical world, points of interest and things like that. Um, we had made the decision to give away uh, our data effectively to anybody who needed it for non-commercial purposes, right? So governments who were doing research to understand the impact to their, uh, to, to their local communities, their states at the federal level, 
Um, we, uh, we, we had um, academics who were doing all this incredible research to figure out uh, and, and tie it into epidemiological studies. Um, and it was around making sure that people could get data as fast as possible. And so we just said, we just opened up the floodgates and said, here you go, uh, and just kind of figured it out from there. Um, and, and it was great, right? A lot of people understood that it was a good thing. Um, and a lot of, and, and of course it's had great effects for SafeGraph as a business at large, but we didn't want process and paperwork and money to get in the way of people actually being able to save lives, make decisions and, and move quickly. Yeah, that's incredible. Thank you. Uh, next question. So SafeGraph's co-founders, Brent Perez and Orn Hoffman, love talking about the three core pillars of data, data acquisition, data transformation, and data delivery. Why is this so fundamental for how businesses should think about their data needs? Um, I'll, like I'll, I'll talk specifically to data businesses to start is that a lot of people generally think that like, if you distill it down, those are really like the three core things that a good data business needs to do, right? And if you're able to forget everything else other than those three things, it means you can concentrate on those three things. You got to find it, you got to clean it up, and then you got to give it to somebody else, right? That's that's the extent of it. So if you build your business around those three pillars, um, it, it allows you to focus, it allows you to just concentrate and get very good on those particular things, build your teams around it and do all that kind of stuff. If you're on the, if you're on the data buying side, you just hope that they have a really great delivery side. You hope that their sourcing is good. You hope that their transformation is good. Uh, but ultimately like building a good data business can be simplified to just those three things. And so that that's, that's how we, that's how we try to focus on, uh, that's how we try to focus on building. Yeah, it makes sense. We couldn't agree more with that. Um, finally, we at Wellflow all followed your launch of Place Key, which is amazing, by the way. We love it, and can really see the value of having universal identifiers across multiple data sources. Um, for SafeGraph and other data reliant businesses, what is the importance of data standards, and how much more value to businesses does joining data sets bring? Totally. So we like we have a thesis. Um, so just, just for context, place key is an, uh, if you guys don't know, place key is an identifier to allow people to join data about the physical world. So if, uh, instead of having to mess with addresses or points and polygons, you can use effectively a place key and all these data sets and join them all together. So we have a thesis uh, amongst sort of the, the data companies in the location space and, and sort of data companies at large in that. Um, well, the easier it is for groups to join in data, we think that more people will be more amenable to buying data. And our, our, our motivations are very, are, are very open out there, right? Like we think that by uh, allowing groups to work around standards, to work around a common identifier, that if you can decrease the friction in which someone needs to evaluate and bring in a new data set, then there's a high likelihood that people may choose to buy additional data, right? It, I'll, I'll make a concrete example. If you've got POIs and all of a sudden you want to add in menu data to those POIs, um, historically, like it would be challenging to go ahead and work with these two different vendors, one who might sell POI data, one who might be working with, uh, who, who might be working or selling menu data. How do you join those things together to make a good user experience, to make a good product? And Right? You got to put a lot of machine learning work. You got to match up all these different like McDonald's since spelled in one name, McDonald's spelled with an apostrophe S in another one, right? And it's, it's a bunch of hard work, right? If you have that common identifier between these data sets, we think that it's one of those one plus one equals three kind of scenarios. And you'll choose to buy additional data to tie onto it faster. So our thought and thesis around standards is, is we are big fans and we think that it's something that's good for the data ecosystem, good for, good for data users, good for data sellers. Um, and, and we hope to, uh, we hope to continue to, to thrive with it. Awesome. Yeah. We couldn't agree more with that. That's why we've joined, joined the team. Um, well, cool. Thank you so much, Ross, Tater Tot champion of oh every skin. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you for being here. Um, now I want to introduce to you all a product designer here at Woflow, Fiona Verani, who will be kicking off a final Q and A with all of the panelists. Welcome Fiona. Thanks, Thanks Ross. Jordan. 
Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to all of our panelists for taking time out of their busy day to be with us. Um, we know it's kind of crazy, so thank you. Um, for the first question, this is directed to Woflow and SafeGraph. Um, you mentioned the power of being able to join Woflow's data sets to others via SafeGraph's place key. Can you give me an example of how this setup would be applied and potentially valuable for other companies? Sure, yeah, I can take that. Um, a good example is uh, within Woflow, each one of our locations that we store has its own unique identifier that we've given it. Each one of our clients is requesting that data, but we can't give them our unique identifier because it's not going to match their unique identifier. In a perfect world, um, which is what SafeGraph has set out to do with PlaceKey, everybody is using the same single unique identifier. And that way, when they request something from us, when they request they store information about a POI, a store, we can give them back that information and they're able to map it and match it immediately without having us having to store, you know, client A's um, unique identifier, client B's unique identifier, and then our own unique identifier. How do we map that all the way around? It definitely gets tricky. It's something we have been uh, working on for years to solve and place key is something that I think uh, really does solve that uh, once widely adopted. Amazing. Ross, do you agree? No, that, that, was, that was great. Um, yeah, the, right, like managing identifiers is, is challenging, right? And I think anybody who's ever bought data knows that like every data company has their own identifier, right? Their own internal identifier that they use to identify a row. Um, and the weird thing is that no one has one that sort of stitches these things together, right? And so if there's that externally linkable single common identifier that that makes menu data tied to POI data, tied to foot traffic data, tied to transaction data, tied to property data. And all these are from five different data vendors. There's one identifier between it. You can have one seamless row and you can just immediately put this into your machine learning models. You can put it into your, your, your products that you're serving up to your users, whatever it may be. It's, it's uh, yeah, managing IDs is hard. <laughs> it's the future. I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna save us a lot of trouble. Yeah, I can totally agree. I've, I've experienced it myself, so I'm glad such a product exists. Um, this is, so for Woflow, uh, we have another question. You guys have started with food tech, but do you see other industries where your platform could be helpful? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Obviously, a lot of what we do is focused around uh, food tech. That just happens to be, you know, the first vertical that we started a few years ago, and we got really good at it. Uh, so we're really proud that we're kind of the leaders in structuring data for food tech. Um, but really any kind of platform or marketplace that needs access to high quality structured data that's difficult to come across. If you can't, you know, tap safe graphs, POI data, for instance, you need something that's rapidly changing, something that uh, needs maintaining or is historically lift, lived offline. Those are exactly the industries and the companies that we want to work with. And so we already work in a number of other similar verticals, whether it's grocery or retail, helping e-commerce stores with some of their merchant onboarding flows and things like that. Um, but really it can be anything that requires high level quality data access. Amazing. Yeah, very much looking forward to it. Um, this is a question for SafeGraph. Is PlaceKey primarily focused in the US or is it also prevalent in other markets? Great question. Uh, it is currently in the United States. It's currently in Canada. It's currently in the Netherlands. And it is launching in the UK in like the next two weeks. Oh, wow. That's super exciting. <laughs> um, great. That's good to know. Um, for Wofo, which languages does the merchant data platform support? So we have the pleasure of working with companies all around the world. And so the, the way that we think about this approach is pretty much language agnostic, whether it's our ML models or our distributed workforce, uh, we're able to operate in all of those markets. So we have customers in Europe, customers in Asia, customers here in, in North and South America. And that requires us being able to, to work in structured data across many different languages even bilingual structured data as well, which uh, starts getting a little trickier. Um, but 
really it was one of those decisions we made early on in our first version of our platform is that we wanted to enable access to the tools and the software uh, and ultimately the structuring capabilities across the board. So yes, we did start in English in, in North America, but quickly um, moved into a lot of different languages as well. Nice, that's awesome. Um, I, this is a pressing question. How long does it typically typically take new partners to get up and running on the merchant data platform? I'm sure a lot of people are wanting to know. We unbo onboarded a client for a pilot this weekend and uh, provided them from, from a Friday meeting to a Monday morning, uh, you know, 50 or so onboarded merchants. Uh, so we're able to turn these things around very rapidly. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time actually building out our infrastructure on the integration side as well. And so access to the platform is available for people that want to sign up uh, and, and test it and, and try access to this kind of data and kick off jobs in our, um, in our distributed workforce almost immediately. Um, then it's how, how integrated do we want to make our two systems more and more systems that we're seeing that traditionally used to be kind of closed are realizing access to this kind of data. Ross put it really well in, in their segment with things that have happened post pandemic, probably not going to go backwards. And uh, a lot of companies are realizing the value now of building more open systems because there's so many good um, versions of, of data and access to structured data out there that they can utilize. And so something that was traditionally maybe more in-house, now if they can plug into a system to get access to catalog, structured data, access to POI data, foot traffic data, they should have an API for that. And so a lot of businesses that we're seeing that maybe a few years ago when we started working with them were more closed are now really open and are relying on data infrastructure businesses, data companies to provide a lot of that data. And so we're really excited about what that brings and the level that it brings. And so a lot of what we focus on with the merchant data platform has been building out these integrations. So we can plug into someone's Salesforce instance or HubSpot instance, for instance, to take a ticket as soon as a merchant comes through in onboarding. We can also plug into a ticketing system, whether you know, someone calls up and says, I need something changed in, in, on my platform. And so we're really excited about getting that data in, but then also pushing it back to our customers' systems. Yeah, it seems to make the operations pretty efficient. Um, I think another question that has presented itself time and time again is what's the difference between you guys, what you guys do, Wellflow, um, Jordan and Will, and a BPO? Also a great question. Um, BPOs or outsourcing companies, um, you can utilize sort of multiple workflows that you want to get outsourced um, and effectively um, that will go to a, another team and you don't have to you know, care about the headcount uh, and all those, all those pieces. So the management of it, the SLAs of it can all be outsourced. And that's great. And there's a lot of workflows that benefit really well from this, uh, from call centers through to um, a lot of other type of systems. A lot of the traditional BPOs and outsourcing companies operate in this kind of generalized category. Uh, and so they do all the hiring, all of the training, and then spin up workflows relatively quickly for their customers. The way that we think about it is taking a step back and from those first principles we talked about earlier and really leveraging the data that we have already on this specialized system. And so all that we focus on is merchant data. And so whether that's structuring a catalog, whether it's uh, store hours, whether it's images for um, catalog items, for instance, that's what we've trained all of our systems on, it's what we train our distribute network on, and we've been able to automate a lot of that. So we started with a tech first approach. And I think a lot of BPOs are sort of trying to catch up a little bit with um, adding on some tech enablement, uh, but fundamentally our business is different in that we specialized early on and was a tech first approach to this kind of work. And, and we only do merchant data. Awesome, awesome answer. Um, this is a question for, I believe, Jordan. Um, I understand that data acquisition is a huge problem that exists, but what about maintaining the, that data? Can this platform help ensure that our menus remain updated? 
Absolutely, yeah. We do have, as as Richard showed, the the uh, jobs. You can do a a menu update, uh, and so as long as the catalog is in our system, even if it's not, we can pull in catalogs from your system, and we have the ability to send that out to our same distributed workforce. There's specialized, trained uh, workforce people that are able to then pick it up and do both um, the the update itself and then the QA of that update before it is then returned back into your system. Awesome. Um, one final question, uh, and this is for Wilflow. Um, are there other aspects of the merchant data onboarding process that you can help with? Um, examples can be photos, phone numbers, addresses, et cetera. Would you like me to take that, Will? Great. Yeah, actually, we do have, um, well, we will continue to always have more, um, more features, but one that we are really excited to announce uh, that we have just started is image mapping, uh, which is a, a high demand product from many, many of our customers. And we do go out and actually do some pretty sophisticated crawling around the web to find the actual restaurant's images through both the, the uh, restaurant's websites and other sources. And we are able to match them to the catalog items through a series of, just like everything else, our machine learning models and the human in the loop. So there are people that are verifying these models. The models have gotten really sophisticated to the point where they can sometimes tell the difference between a double bacon Western cheeseburger and a double bacon Western cheeseburger with pickles. Like it's pretty insane. Some things that they can pick up that we can't. Um, and so, yeah, that is something we have brought to the table and we have started rolling that out this month. Shout yeah. out to our data scientists for that. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much everyone for being here again today and answering all of these questions. Um, and it was a pleasure to be able to facilitate. Uh, I'll turn it back to Will. Thanks Fiona for, uh, for taking those questions. Thank you everyone who put a question in. Uh, we really do appreciate that. Yeah, and thank you for joining us today, this morning, or your evening, where they, you may be uh, listening to, to this. Uh, we've had an absolute pleasure hosting you today for our first event. Um, hopefully, you learned something today, and you got to hear from, from our great panelists uh, and uh, special guests. So thank you, everyone who joined us today. Thank you, panelists. And, and thank you, Ross, as well, for, for jumping in and, and answering some, some interesting questions. I really enjoyed that discussion. We obviously love talking about this stuff. And so please feel free to reach out with any questions that you may have uh, if we didn't get to them today or if you have any other burning questions about merchant data or, or data in, in general or even questions for Ross. Uh, reach out to us. Happy to answer those questions. If we work with you currently, thank you so much for um, working with us and continuing to work with us and for those as well um, who have joined that are, that are browsing uh, we hope to look forward to talking uh, about potentially working with you soon so that's it from me and and the woeflow team thank you again very much for joining us this morning and i hope you have a great day